Hello everyone, welcome to Internally Screening. Today, we are continuing Hooptober, in spite of it being November, with this review of Horror Express, a 1972 film directed by Eugenio Martin, starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, the dynamic duo, are back at it again. This time though, both seeming to play good guys, rather than them being protagonist and antagonist to one another, as is so usually the case. This film is set in 1906 on the Trans-Siberian train route. Christopher Lee has discovered an ancient fossil of some kind of primordial creature who he believes is like the, a, a progenitor to man. And he's really excited to see the scientific advancements that can be made for, uh, in terms of the study of evolution. But he's very protective over what's in his crate and lots of people keep trying to spy on it and find out what's inside it. But little does he know that there is something amiss with his scientific discovery that leads to some spooky goings on. A few people end up murdered and there is an investigation in a sort of capsule setting of the train. And it's up to Christopher Lee and crew to determine what exactly is the root of all of this carnage. So Rupert, what did you make of Horror Express? Well, given that it's called Horror Express and it's a, an older film with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, who we've both seen in many a Hammer film, I was expecting it to be, like you said, very capsule, very low concept, mystery stuff. And then, you know, early on in the film, I'm like, oh, well, there is going to be a monster, so that's cool. Little did I know quite how ridiculous and high concept this film actually is, despite its sort of deceiving appearance as sort of from the outside going and assuming what film's going to be like. Mm. So this is a perfect example for me of Never judge a book by its cover because this film is wild. We won't go, I won't go straight into plot spoilers, but it definitely escalates. It's not just a monster film on a train. It has a little bit more borderline sci-fi concept stuff going on towards the end, which yeah. I was uh, actually really impressed by because my worry with a lot of these older films is when I go into them, I'm thinking, well, it might be good, but it might be boring, right? <laughs> right because yeah, yeah. a lot of those, for example, Hammer films, a lot of them are quite cheaply made. Uh, they're very reliant on these older stars who obviously we don't have the same affinity for as, as people would have done at the time. Yeah. And they're sort of coasting off the charm that these people had. And so they kind of end up feeling a little bit dated. Or they're like a sort of adaptation of an older story that people at the time were fond of, say like the Sherlock Holmes or the Dragons, okay. right? Yes. Yeah. Whereas this is, to my knowledge, a, an original concept and it sort of is a capsule film, but it actually does like a lot of, it makes the most of it. It yeah, doesn't yeah. just like, oh, we're on one train so it's an excuse to be lazy. Mm. It actually kind of takes the setting and uses it to the maximum extent that it possibly can. And I actually really enjoyed it. It's very silly, it's very schlocky. It, it feels quite purposefully camp, I think, at points, which kind of helps because it's not like a sort of, you know, ooh, you know what's going on? You know, tapping the nose and right. you know, winking at the camera constantly. But it's, it's still self-aware in a way that makes it sort of light-hearted and fun and yeah, not yeah. kind of like a dire, dull experience. Yeah, it's got a pretty impressive ensemble cast. So we've already mentioned Christopher Lee and yeah. Peter Cushing also get Teddy Savalas in this film. Yeah, randomly. Who turns up <laughs> towards the end. When things are going all right, uh, they kind of call upon one of the train stops to like yeah. pull an emergency stop and Teddy Savalas is just like woken up. He just like turns around. He's like in bed with some like yeah. young babe. And he's like smoking a cigar. Like, don't you fucking wake me up, bitch. I like to think they just had him just on set for a week and he was like, I'll be in your film. <laughs> and they just like had him in. They're like, we've got to write a new ending, lads. We've got Telly Savalas for a week. What can we do? <laughs> and that's what they did because he's he's true in the scenery. Yes, he in is. In a major way. And yeah, yeah. It. His his role is not massive, but the impact he has is just like one of kind of barely controlled chaos. Really. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. He sort of takes charge of the situation. He, he's got such a braggadocious attitude to it. He's basically a train the... pirate. Yes, that's a good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, he definitely has that vibe to him. I think... Christopher Lee brings a lot of class to the concept. Yeah, it's as quite well. a restrained Christopher Lee report performance, yeah, which is kind of like an interesting one because obviously he's quite naturally. Oh, well, Christopher Lee. And he's got a lot of sort of grandeur to like, him. Yeah, like yeah. a lot of uh, gravitas. Yeah. And he still has that, but he's very much dialing it back here. He's playing like a more subdued. There's secrets to this. He's character. like a re re reserved yeah. man of science. He's, he's kind of actually playing the role that Peter Cushing would normally play. Yes. And then yeah. Peter Cushing, who's again sort of. Got a much less significant role than Christopher Lee does, but he's kind of the kind of sneaking about, like being a bit yeah. more mischievous and trying to like worm his way into what's going on. And I guess because of Christopher Lee's notoriety, particularly in this era of being the villain, 
I was inherently mistrustful of his character yeah. to begin with. <laughs> he's just sinister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when he's like hiding his creation or his discovery and like sort of not letting anyone near the crate, which is really a huge amount of the first sort of 15 minutes yeah. of the film, it's just like, let me see your crate. Yeah, he's yeah. like, no, fuck off. <laughs> because it seems like he's got a lot to hide and that he maybe he's not letting on as much as he could and should be, that maybe he has nefarious intent, but he's actually just, yeah, he's just an excited scientist. It's not that bad in the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess we kind of do have to talk about the crate, <laughs> given that's kind of what the film revolves around. Yes. So it is an alien. <laughs> it's a giant monkey alien. Well, okay, it's <laughs> the the monkey isn't an alien. The alien. Oh, that's what the alien is in the monkey's is, brain. It's some kind somehow. of. I believe they describe it as like an entity of energy or right. something. Like it's some kind of inorganic life. It form. suddenly becomes weirdly like Lovecraftian and like yeah. unknowable horror. Yes. out of nowhere. Yeah, the concept gets wilder and wilder the more they unpiece because it's like okay. Well, a... first off, you find out what the power it does is. Right? Yes. So 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 every time it kills something. It looks it in the eyes and it goes red eye mode. Yeah, and uh, everyone who looks at it, they start like sort of having a fit and then their eyes and mouth and nose are bleeding and then the eyes go white. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out that the reason that's happening is that the alien is wiping their brain and making them smooth well, and, and draining them of all of their knowledge and memory. And doesn't it sort of implant... Because don't they, they kill the body of the monkey thing, right? At yes. some point. Yeah. But... It's able to basically, by staring in the eyes, USB transfer <laughs> its entire like consciousness, consciousness. Yeah. and it's essentially doing this over and over and over again yeah. to like accumulate knowledge mass. Yeah, so it can steal knowledge from other people, but when it's about to die, it will transfer itself. Yes. So it doesn't do the same exact thing, but basically the inspector, the train guard that kills the monkey, he's the last person to see yeah. him. So therefore, as he's dying, he, uh, as the alien is dying, he transfers And is stuff. he the guy who's kind of like, oh, I've got to hide my hair. My hairy arm. monkey he arm. slowly starts becoming the monkey. Yes. Which is amazing. Like, I, I think that a lot of, I mean, this isn't that old, let's be fair, because this is a 70s film. Yeah. It's not, I'm, I'm talking about it like it's a 50s, 60s film. It kind of has a similar vibe. It's got a sort of, for the time, this was probably a retro. It feels like it, right. yeah. But what I really appreciate about this film is that, like I was saying, just really going for a fucking concept and having a concept so out there and actually kind of conveying it in a really fun, even though it's silly, right? Mm. Because this film is schlock to the to the end. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What I really like is that it has this kind of wacky fucking idea and it actually makes a storyline out of yeah, it. Yeah, it fully commits it to it. Yeah, yeah, it's not like, it doesn't laugh at itself. It, go, it, it introduces this outlandish yeah. concept and goes, no, what if this was a real, yeah, end, yeah. you know? And, uh, you know, because there's a lot of scientists and sort of like educated minds on the train, they're all thinking about the scientific implications of such yeah. a discovery. And, but that also puts them in danger because this is a creature that tries to gather information. So yeah. suddenly they become key targets for yeah, it. Yeah. It's actually quite sort of... It's cleverly It's prepared, an interesting yeah. like weaving of the, of the story. And of course, like everyone, because he initially transfers to the the guard and the uh, the guard has all the inside scoop because everyone's just trusting yeah, yeah. him with all this information. Anyone that has even the slightest bit of knowledge, he'll just sort of like <laughs> find them in a room, close the door, <laughs> mind beam their brain into mush, and then just fuck off. Be like, oh, he's killed again. When when you go into fun like this, you kind of go in sort of expecting to know what's going to happen at a certain point, yeah. right? Because a lot of these older horror films are quite predictable just by virtue of them being. Uh, low budget or mm. really short or whatever it is right or for the time or because they're so heavily troped at this point yes you go in kind of expecting to figure it out and what's fun about this film is that i i was not i was not i was not even trying to guess what was going no, on no 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 so i was like fuck if it i would, know you know like what? trying to actually figure out what the mystery of what this like monkey was doing i was like what is it doing yeah no it, it was a genuine mystery yeah, I guess because it is such a fresh concept, your brain doesn't automatically connect the dots to many of the things you would have seen before. I mean, aesthetically, the parallel draws me to Murder on the Orient Express, right? Well, that's, but yeah. you would never try and solve this film in the way that you automatically try and solve a problem. It's only similar in so much as it's a mystery set on a train. It's yeah, not it's actually a, aesthetically but, similar in story. No, right? no, but I mean, it, I guess more the design and setting yes, exactly, rather yeah. than yes yeah but um yeah everything else about it feels much more much closer to hammer horror definitely hammer vibes yeah, yeah. um which even, they must have been going for with the cast yeah i imagine so but as far as i remember this is a spanish production yeah. so it's like 
it paying homage and, and I almost certainly with getting the two lead actors they did. I wanted to talk about one of my favorite characters in the film is the strange Russian mystic. I, <laughs> I forget his name, but he reminds me of Rasputin. So he just I'm, looks a lot like Rasputin. I'm just going to call yeah. him Rasputin. <laughs> so I really loved his performance because he's clearly like sort of deranged and he's not particularly trusted or respected from the get-go. Yeah. So you automatically kind of, you're drawn to him as this kind of dark figure. That some he's, he's kind of, I think, supposed to represent like the religious element. Yes, the concept, for sure. Because like, like you said, there's a lot of scientists. Yeah, yeah. It's like he's kind of like an extreme version of like religious derangement. Which is interesting because he kind of goes down a, a strange trajectory of being very fearful and suspicious of there being some kind of demonic presence on the train. And then when encounter when he's face to face with that entity, he starts to worship it. Yeah, he thinks it's like a god, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. He's like, he, he, well, he actually, he actually starts to refer to it as like Satan. So he kind of seems right, to do okay, this like yeah. about turn of like, oh yeah, you, <laughs> you know, in the face of um, whoever such, shows up first. Yeah, in the face of such power, I'm just gonna take the L and switch teams. Uh, and uh, and a further spoiler is that um, he then has the consciousness of the alien transferred to him. So at the end of the film, he is our main. He's like the arch nemesis. Of yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Which is, I don't, I don't know what to make of it. I don't know if the symbolism of, in the film is as meaningful as it's as it's sort of trying to be, mm. right? Maybe I just need to watch it again and just think like, try actually concentrate on it. Because honestly, the first time watching this film, I was just trying to keep up. Right, yeah, yeah. Know? But I do think, again, it's just very admirable for this sort of schlocky horror film to have religious versus science imagery. Yeah. Which obviously has been done many times before. Like I.E. Frankenstein is like the classic example of that. But that's like, you know, based on a famous, you know, arguably the first science fiction novel. And this is just a sort of schlocky hammer homage. Mm -hmm. So it's like... I think the setting of it in the 19, early 1900s is like kind of, it must be poignant. And uh, in in conjunction with that, because there he has arguments, like Christopher Lee's character has arguments with other characters. Um, uh, another key character is the princess. Yeah, yeah. Um, who he kind of forms sort of, it's like slightly romantic isn't yeah it? a sort of pseudo romantic bond with her there's this kind of unspoken chemistry the instant they meet uh, in spite of their age gap there's kind of it, it, it's not a one to one like romance it doesn't go thing, all the way but there's but there's like a kind a, of spark there. there's an there, and it, it, it genuinely an interesting and like fun dynamic that they explore and I really like their interaction but they have a conversation at one point uh, about evolution and yeah. about how she doesn't believe in like do you believe in that crap she, yeah, he's like yeah, evolution yeah. is a fact and it's like, <laughs> and she says, "Oh, it's a disgrace. It's awful. Like, uh, it's it's a it's a, an insult to God to suggest such a thing." And well, like, it's interesting as well that the monster is a monkey in that case, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the missing link. There's some kind of comment being made here, I think, about yeah, science and evolving understanding of the world. But yeah. I don't know if it's super clear and super tangible because, like you say, you get so swept up in the craziness of everything that's going on. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like criticisms or complaints of the film, pretty much they all come down to like presentation because this film, by virtue of its age, and a clear budget that has gone primarily to two actors, yeah. it does somewhat sort of limit, you know, you got, but basically you've got some pretty goofy effects, some like acting that's, None of it's terrible. No, no. But none of it's. I, w I wouldn't call any of the acting great. It's no. all just like fitting the tone. And... You know, up and ups and downs. Some yeah. of it. Some of it. I remember there's a couple of you know line deliveries here and there that that don't quite work. And you know the awkwardness that you get with these kind of films. They're sort of generally for me personally sort of drag them down just a little bit. Maybe I'm being a bit harsh. And I, I, I guess as the chaos builds, I don't know if the film is particularly well equipped to contain it. How do you Does mean? that make sense? Like once. Uh, Telly Savalas appears yeah. and you've got the gunfight it, it's sort of like what is going I, on I, but then like there's the, the scene I can't remember exactly what's going on mm. but they've got like the sword in the dark right and he like goes and he kills all the guys who is it who does that in the film so Telly Savalas finds out it's the guard yeah. Telly Savalas goes into the room where the guard is gone with all his trained guards, yeah, and they all get picked off one by one. They all basically turn into zombies. Yes, yes, and then, and it, then yeah, yeah in, a, in his dire moment, he like activates zombie mode, which is kind of amazing. But I don't know. It felt like the crescendo was just constantly happening. I don't know. Quite yes, how to well, it's it. more that the crescendo didn't really feel like it met a sort of succinct ending yeah. in so much as and then the train blows up. It just kind of built, <laughs> built, built, and then film's done. Yeah. Train explosion. Yeah, these films also do always end. 
mega abruptly. Yeah. That is a rule that has to happen. There's this kind of, you know, villain hero interaction mm. before he does the zombie activation where he's trying to sort of barter with Christopher Lee, essentially, and say, let me be free, I'll be your experiment, you can let me live. All the knowledge. You can have all my knowledge, like, think of the scientific benefit I will bring you. And he's like, yeah, but if I let you go, you're like, you could kill the whole planet. Yeah, yeah. You, you could wreak all sorts of destruction. Basically, because they don't agree, he then go activate zombie mode. But then there's not kind of much more resolution to that debate that is kind of brought up in that moment, that kind of moral quandary. It's Which just is basically of, the crux of the film. Yeah, it's kind of introduced there directly and then never explored further because then it's like he gets, the, the alien gets hold of the train and then they do something with the signaling and it just flies, it flies off, off a cliff. cliff and it blows up. Yeah, yeah. and they all manage, all, all the people. I think they, cool they, they separate though. the trains, I think. Yeah, they do. And, and the front of the train goes, goes off, yes. So yeah, yeah, it is a cool miniature. And uh, yeah, you know, they do a lot. I think a lot of the sets, you know, in spite of, there must have been a lot of financial constraints like you were suggesting earlier, yeah. but I think all the sets look lovely. I think oh, it's it very like well a, executed. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it it's works. just, yeah, I mean, I'm more talking about like some of the sloppiness, like the bleeding eyes look terrible, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. It, it's kind of enjoyable, right? Yeah, I feel it, it I don't know, it, for the era, like it's exactly the sort of thing I expect. For the 70s, that is still terrible blood. But I don't know, uh, to me it's like, <laughs> the thing is, I guess I wasn't so bothered about the blood as I was, intrigued by the specific nature of the deaths because I thought it was quite unique this yeah. whole like bleeding from the eyes and then like the whites like them turning fully white it's a cool white. conceit I'm more, I mean more like there are points in the film where I feel like the goofiness no, uh, yeah. is kind of detracting because the concept is so high the goofiness is kind they of they can't quite yeah. meet it there because yeah. it's like yeah no I, I do I do appreciate that I guess there's also kind of parallels to the thing now that I think about yeah, it yeah big time when yeah. you say that yeah. yeah and this wasn't how that much when was the thing 1980 well the original thing was a 50s well, 50s film, film yeah so, but then yeah. you have the the john carpenter i guess I agree, yeah, at least probably decade, influenced yeah. potentially by the original thing yeah or at least the story i wouldn't be surprised because again it's set in like the arctic and, yes exactly you know it's an alien that can take the guise of other people and kind of infiltrate their way but rather than it being like a kind of physical thing because the, the thing is very much about uh, the corporeal horror of it. This is more of like a psychological thing. Yes, it's exactly. like having yeah. your identity stolen, all your knowledge, your Which memories. is genius, because you don't need that much money to show that. Because if you just go, like, oh, it's mind beats. Ah, uh, <laughs> my brain is melting. It, it's a clever it's a clever way of doing it. And actually doing something different within the constraint you have. Yeah. So I do appreciate that. There's also just, uh, before we get to the scores, there's one bullshit bit of information I remember um, when they're doing their investigation they've like got done an autopsy on someone's brain and they found out it's completely smooth <laughs> and um peter cushing immediately knows that the brain has become smooth because all the memories have been that's sucked science. out of it that's because that's science when you form a memory that's when you get a groove in the brain that's what he's saying that's, a fact. that's what he was saying you never so heard the insult babies, smooth brain yeah well true but yeah. does this mean that babies are born with completely smooth brain. It's basically a tennis ball made of like pink flesh. <laughs> and and gradually it, it, it kind expands of... expands and creases as you get older. Yeah. I would like to suggest that that is hilarious pseudoscience that they just chucked in there because it makes the plot easier. Because it's like, well, if we accept this is true... If it's set in 1901 or whatever, it's believable that someone back then... I mean, even then that would be ridiculous, but... You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, yeah, I guess you could you can palm that off as a... Uh, that's like kind of nice historical accuracy even though it's definitely <laughs> they definitely knew that wasn't yeah. how the brain worked I just then. thought it was kind of amusing because it's one of those it's, it's one of those contrivances it's like right let's just shortcut our way to the guy knowing exactly what's yeah. going on which I don't mind because otherwise then it's just like a complete guessing game so so I, I, I appreciate the necessity I just thought it was kind <laughs> of amusing right then Rupert what would you give Horror Express out of 10? I would give Horror Express a 7 out of 10 I found it to be surprisingly just very enjoyable. I'd happily watch it again. I actually am kind of looking forward to watching it again mm. at some point. I think it'd be a great film to watch with someone who hasn't seen it. Sure. Sort of unsuspecting. Watch this film. Oh, it's called Horror Express. Yeah, it's pretty good. And then just see their reaction as the actual plot of the film yeah. unfolds in front of them. It's goofy, but like I said, it's, it's so committed to an impressively high concept idea for what it is. Uh, and I think it pulls it off pretty well. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not, I wouldn't call it exceptionally well made as a film, but it does have a real quality to it that I yeah. wasn't expecting. So yeah, seven out of 10. Yeah, I'm with you, seven out of 10. I, I think 
it's a, a, a lovely, surprising hidden gem. Yeah. Something, a film I'd never heard of. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be very popular. No, it doesn't really seem to be talked about. And yet, I found it very charming. It's got like a great, as you said at the beginning, great sense of fun uh, and sort of spectacle to it. It's so unique with its concept. Yeah. Um, even though, you know, you can say it draws for potentially or draws parallels to like the thing, but murder on murder on the Orient Express. Yes, yeah. But the just kind of boiling it down to a combination of those two things would do it an injustice. It does feel very much its own thing. Yeah, and it was just it was just a really really enjoyable experience. There are pitfalls and and things like that, but yeah, it was it was a lovely. It doesn't really detract from the enjoyment. It's no. hard to come out. You know, it's it's just one of those solid seven out of ten films. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and like you say, I would stick this on any time and have a blast. So there we have it. Thank you very much for watching our review. If you enjoyed it and you agree with us, uh, give it a like and let us know in the comments how you felt about this film. And maybe consider subscribing to the channel if you're interested in more horror review content coming up shortly over the next few weeks. And then we will be returning to our schedule of reactions and whatever the fuck we feel like afterwards. Um, if you dislike this review, press dislike. Please check out this film if you haven't. It's a great underrated gem. And we will catch you again in the next review. Peace. Peace.